it's not easy to create a good competitive FPS map. Even games as prominent in esports as Quake, CSGO and Overwatch have, or used to have, some pretty poorly designed levels in their map pools. But why is it so hard to create a good competitive first person map? Why even professionals making a living out of building maps used for esport purposes often struggle to design a good one? And why does it take weeks, months, if not more, to think of, build and polish a good map? We'll try to go over some of the reasons for that in this video. Perhaps the most obvious answer to that is that level design can never truly be separated from game design. You don't go through the same thought process when conceiving a map for CSGO or for Overwatch. The first one being a very slow paced traditional FPS where positioning and target acquisition is key, and the other being a faster paced hero shooter where team composition and coordination are where it's at. In other words, one has double jumping, wall climbing, ghost dashing ninjas, while the other doesn't. But the common factors that every designer has to be careful about when making a map are mobility and perception. I mean, you can call these two criteria whatever you want, but they will basically always mean the same thing. Mobility being about how well the ratio between freedom and restriction of the player's movements is managed, and perception about how well line of sight is being handled. These two factors are linked and dependent from one another. And that's where the first difficulty comes from. You can tackle them independently. In an FPS game, being visible equates to being killable. The only way to counter this, without any game design twists being applied yet, is to take cover. But cover automatically equates to restriction in the player movements. That's a challenge in itself. The designer has to make sure that there are obstructions to the line of sight of the players without taking away too much freedom of movements from them. The covers can be simple props and clutter, or even just walls surrounding an unplayable area. These obstructions have to be thought of well enough so that they provide both adequate cover and make players' movements unpredictable because they allow line of sight to be broken, yet still accessible. They also need to be integral part of the overall map's architecture and design, because not only do they serve as covers, but they're also there to make sure that the players go where you want them to go. In other words, in theory, a well-designed map should be easy to explore, or rather it should make sense when you do it, to the extent that you shouldn't need a minimap to find your way. That's a lot of things to consider already. Let's take an example, the middle section of Counter-Strike's Dust 2, a map that almost everyone knows. On one hand, the terrorist spawn. On the other, the path leading to the B side from the counter-terrorist spawn. In this situation, the terrorists have a positioning advantage and are able to secure the line of sight before the counter-terrorist. To compensate that, the cities have a cover advantage. They can hide behind the doors and with the exception of these doors there's no obstructions to their line of sight. They can also take advantage of the game design by using resources put at their disposal, like smokes and flashbangs. But the city's covers are not absolute because of the terrorists being able to shoot through the doors. They can also scout the mid to know how many cities are going B, that way they'll be able to know whether to attack A or B site. Yet the counter-terrorists can still be unpredictable by using smokes or using different kind of strategies. Going B to mid, rushing T-spawns from B, going mid to B, stacking on one side of the mid door to go either A or B as a group, etc, etc. Overall, this seemingly simple corridor can be used in many different ways and manages to give different advantages and disadvantages to both sides while still being pre-balanced. The small corridor also works as a connector between the two bomb sites. If you go from one side to the other, you have to go through that corridor. But except from that one straight line to cross, you're not forced to stick to one option to engage the enemy. That's where another difficulty arises. 
A map needs to enable rotations through loops. Let's say you're anywhere in the middle of the map and you want to go to the A site. You have three options to do so. You can either go through city spawn, through short, or through long. All these paths lead to the A site on one end and to the mid on the other, in a way that allows easy rotations. That's a loop. Most CSGO maps are built around two or three main loops. These loops are necessary, especially for a game as slow as CSGO, where positioning is half the work. But it's also mandatory even in a game like Overwatch, because of the way the game is designed, enabling, in theory, the defenders to hold a choke for as long as they want. A flank route oftentimes being the only options to go through that choke. With these loops, if one path is being heavily guarded, you can just go through another. The problem is that you need to avoid having too many or too few of these loops, because they need to be fair and balanced for both the offense and the defense. If you only have one path leading to the objective, and no option to easily rotate, the defenders can just hold this one choke and they will have an unfair advantage. But if there are too many paths and loops on the map, it becomes impossible for the defenders to estimate from which side the enemy will engage. They will have to guess instead, and that's not fair neither. So the designers need to find the perfect balance, so that their map can be fair for all players. Then there's another thing, a very subtle one that gets way too easily overlooked when judging a map, but which can be decisive when it comes to coming to a conclusion on whether a map is good or bad. And it's something that every player can figure out, most of the times without even realizing it. Is the time needed to reach a given destination well handled? And it's not only the time that it takes to go to the objective from spawn that matters, no, it matters every time when there's a possible confrontation between two enemies. So basically, as long as there are no obstruction to both teams' line of sight. I honestly don't think I'm competent enough to explain this clearly and in details, so instead I'd just take another example. Once again, I'm going to talk about a CSGO map, because most of them are very simple and easy to apprehend, which makes my work much easier to be honest. We'll talk about the middle of Cash. Cash's middle is pretty well balanced. The terrorist can either pick from garage or boost, while the CDs can either pick from sniper nest or white box. Let's pretend that both a counter terrorist and a terrorist decide to pick from, respectively, sniper nest and garage. The city being the defender, it's logical that he reaches his destination before the terrorist. Sure, the city has a positioning advantage, but in reality, it quickly becomes a duel of skill and wits. Where is the enemy? Where is he aiming at? Am I a better shot than him? This situation is absolutely fair. The game design mostly favors the terrorist for many different reasons. So a very subtle better position for the defenders doesn't sound like that bad of a deal. But it would become problematic if the city had more time to set up. If both enemies rush to mid, the city will only be able to go as far as this before the terrorist can pick out of cover and take him out. But if the defender had more time, he could set up any way he wanted in the mid. Instead of three hiding points, sniper nest, white box, and sandbags, the city will have six options. That's way too many. And once again, the problem wouldn't really be the way the map is set up, even if it is the reason why there's a problem to begin with. No, the real problem would be the time that it takes to reach your destination. This last one isn't as crucial as the others, but it's still a pretty big deal and a huge challenge for level designers. The creation of skill and game sense opportunities throughout the map. These opportunities can be as basic as crouch jumping, finding a grenade spot or using a boost, but the designer still needs to manage them with care. These opportunities are there to reward players who mastered certain skills or techniques, they should be rewarding enough so that it would motivate players to get better at the game, but not enough that it would give an unfair advantage to anyone exploiting it. Once again, it's all about balance. I've always approached the level design of a map with that motto in mind. A good map should be restrictive without being oppressing. You should feel free while exploring it, 
but neither lost or exposed. Level design is all about fine-tuning, finding that sweet spot that will make a map unforgettable. And it's probably way more difficult than what you might think. Hopefully you liked this video and maybe even learned something from it. With that being said, don't be a bad boy, kiss your mama goodnight, and tune in for next video. See ya.